You mentioned that um, uh, Kepler and Brahe were, were very close. Brahe was a, a mentor or a teacher. Um, tell me a little bit about that relationship. He was a, yeah, well, you know, he's a, he was a wealthy Danish aristocrat who had just moved from having royal support and he had huge amounts of money. He had a, he had a royal patron who, who was completely supporting him. So his budget was kind of comp comparable to the whole NASA budget uh, in, the, in the moon era. Uh, so lots of money, and then, then his patron died. And uh, rather than hang on there, he tried to find a new patron. The new patron was in Prague, was the Emperor Rudolf II, who was kind of a loony, but, uh, but wanted to support uh, Brahe's work. So Brahe moved there, and, uh, and he knew about this guy, Kepler, who had written this uh, uh, rather speculative book about about uh, the how the planets were planetary orbits were spaced according to the um, according to the five platonic solids and he, he was he wrote back to Kepler and said you know it's an interesting idea but you need to support this with uh, sound observations and Kepler was saying wow Brahe observations that's what I that's what I really I agree I need I need Brahe's observations but meanwhile Brahe was looking so Brahe invited Kepler to come to Prague just at a time when all the Protestants were being booted out of Graz where Kepler was living uh, Kepler was hoping to be kind of a colleague and Brahe was looking at Kepler as this um, upstart you know, provincial math, math teacher from a little rinky-dink town in Austria uh, and not a colleague at all. So they had, they had really quite very strident clashes. Uh, eventually they got so they could, they could work together, but it wasn't very long before Brahe died. And there's some theories about that. Well, uh, yeah, although I think they've been generally debunked. Uh, um, that Kepler had, Kepler was, would have been in a position maybe to, to administer some mercury to Brahe. I think that was involved in the, th uh, anyway, no, nobody's really accepting that idea, but um, uh, the, the usual account is that he had, he really died of, of a burst bladder from urine retention and had a, a kind of systemic infection and died fairly soon after that. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was a rocky relationship between Kepler and, and Brahe. And I think Br with Brahe and a lot of other people around him. So by the time Brahe died, it seemed like Kepler was the only, uh, as a colleague of mine said, he was the last man standing. Mm -hmm. He was, this is how Kepler came to be the imperial, the mathematician to the Emperor Rudolf II. Uh, from uh, a couple of years before, he was a rather poor math teacher in a provincial town in Austria. <laughs> um, when, you, uh, when you found out that you were winning the award, or, or, or now, you know, as you think about it, um, what does it mean to you to have that recognition? I was really, I was astonished that, that, they, would, that they would consider me, because uh, it's usually to established academics, you know, it's gone to you know, my supervisor at Cambridge, uh, Cambridge lecturer in history of science. Um, I think Owen Gingrich got one, uh, head of the history of science department at Harvard, and, uh, and also an astrophysicist <laughs> originally. Um, uh, other people with, with distinguished academic careers, and I have had a very atypical career. I have never, uh, I've never received tenure from anybody. And, uh, not even St. John's, and uh, uh, and I was not most recently not really on a tenure track uh, appointment, although uh, although I was eventually given a a, a full faculty appointment, but uh, uh, but that was about the time that I retired. <laughs> <laughs> so so I was I was kind of surprised that uh, you know I was and I did all this research on just hustling up grants from the National Science Foundation NEH and and other bodies uh, to do the research and, um, and I published the books. Uh, I actually started, my wife and I started a publishing company. The two 
Uh, the two books that I translated of Kepler's are, are published by Green Lion Press, which is my press. Um, so I'm decidedly outside in the normal bounds of, of academe. But on the other hand, there aren't that many uh, really um, uh, accomplished historians of astronomy. So we all know each other. So they, I sort of got to, got to be known by, by uh, people who, uh, who knew this field and, and were thinking, well, he's not really, I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> but, Do you feel see. like Kepler is the last man standing at this point? <laughs> no, no, there were a lot of other people. Good. Uh, uh, that, uh, that, and I was surprised that I was, I mean, they, they, they asked me if I'd be willing to be one of the candidates for it. And I thought, well, sure, I'll be a candidate, but they're not going to give it to me. They're going to give it to somebody who's, who's got, who had a long career at some, some place like the University of Indiana or, or, uh, or University, one of the California campuses. Uh, 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 somebody who's, who has a long, you know, who's written dozens and dozens of, of uh, articles and uh, perhaps uh, a half a dozen books. And uh, I'm not one of those guys. <laughs> And somebody told me early on, you're, not gonna, you're really not ever going to make tenure by doing something like a translation. It's just not, not the sort of thing that, that you get tenure for. And I said, well, OK, I'll just do it on my own. Fascinating. But like you said, it's that chance really, as you're going through Kepler's journals, to be in his head or, or over his shoulder, yes. seeing what he saw and, and thought as he jotted those things it, down. It is, and unfortunately, it's not, it's not really so much what is, um, what is current in history of science, which history of science is uh, largely uh, social history now, although the pendulum may be swinging back in the other direction. But it used to be uh, in the 1950s and 60s that historians of science read and studied his, historical scientific works and were trying to interpret and understand those. And then what happened after that was a kind of philosophical sea change where they were starting to look at social relations of science and who was patronizing whom and uh, how scientists, what was the social context in which science, scientists were working and how did, that, uh, how did that affect their scientific work? Uh, and that applies really very well to modern kind of large scientific structures where you have, you have to have multiple scientists working on a particular project together, like uh, you know, uh, uh, giant, uh, giant particle accelerators, where, uh, where you have just uh, a whole army of, uh, of uh, brilliant people all doing, and I'm not, uh, I'm not denigrating that that sort of thing. That that's really amenable to the to the more uh, the more social approach to understanding how how science gets constructed. But uh, but still, I think there's and I think a lot of people agree with this that there's room for people who are really just wanting to study the ideas and understand how how those ideas develop and how they make sense and maybe even to try to help students uh, uh, get an appreciation for that process, because that seems to me to be one of the very best ways to learn science, is to be an apprentice to somebody like Kepler or Galileo or Lavoisier or whatever. <laughs>